StrongBeCast, episode 256 for Monday, March 12, 2012, Resolution. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hi, hey, Pamela. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? I'm doing really well. Uh, it's, uh, spring is coming. Everything's uh, getting a lot better now. We have, and we have and neither horrible. of us experienced horrible storms this week, and our thoughts are with all of you that had tornadoes, but no, we're all safe here. Yeah, we don't get any tornadoes on the west coast of Canada. And they went Everything north else. and south of me. So we, we Did they actually come close to you? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I saw some just some crazy uh, surveillance footage and things like that, and it's just, it's just terrible. Um, uh, so uh, just a, a few things to let people know uh, this week. One thing is we've moved the virtual star parties to Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And so this is where we go and connect up uh, as many telescopes as we can into a live Google Plus Hangout, and then people can see what it looks like to actually look through these telescopes. And it's really great. I gotta say, we've we've had some amazing views of the, all the planets at, at various points. Um, we've had beautiful deep sky objects. Uh, just like last night, we're, when we're recording, we viewed uh, M51, which is the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, so, so if you have any interest in seeing what it looks like to to look through a telescope and see different varieties, I highly recommend you check that out. And that that shows up um, 7 p.m. Pacific time, 10 Eastern. Is that 3 a.m. in in 3 a.m. GMT, 2 yeah, p.m. GMT. Sydney. So it's a, it's a pretty great time, and you can ask us questions, and we take requests, so you're like, oh, I'd really like to see the Flame Nebula. Yeah, no problem. We move the telescope over and take a look at the Flame Nebula. So it's, it's really neat. Uh, but we're always looking for more astronomers, and I guess this is the point. So yeah. if you have the ability to, to view from your telescope onto your computer, whether you've, you know, you've got a uh, DSLR connected to your telescope and that's streaming into your computer, whether you've got uh, any varieties of like webcams or toucans or toucams or things, you know, ast astronomy related cameras, and you can get a view from your telescope into your uh, like onto your computer screen, then we can help you do the rest, which is to get that view into this hangout. And it's a really great time. And you, you know, if you're an astronomer and you love to share your view of the sky, it's it's really worthwhile and rewarding to have all of these people. And you know, we're getting hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of people watching live as we do this, and it's really exciting. So again, I just I plead with you, if you're an astronomer who can do this, I would, you know, please drop me an email. So you can email me directly at info at universetoday.com. Just drop me an email and say you'd like to get involved, and then I'll just talk you through all the rest, and we can try out some practices and do some hangouts and, and go from there. Like I said, really rewarding. This is, this is what it's all about. And, and we're open to people with small hand-guided telescopes and professional observers who are on CAC and want to screen share their professional observations. So all yeah. the range are all welcome. Absolutely, yeah. We've got people with fairly small, couple hundred dollar telescopes that they're hiding, and so you see the image jiggling around to people who have twenty, thirty thousand dollar setups that, and uh, and everything in between. So so you know, no telescope is too low quality. We we really enjoy it. Because it just gives people that view across yeah. all the different telescopes. So, yeah. All right, well, that's uh, that out of the way. Why don't we uh, get cracking? So, so when it comes to telescopes, astronomers really just care about resolution. How much can you see? Your resolution defines how much science you can get done, and it depends on your gear, wavelength, and viewing conditions. And putting a telescope in space really helps, too. Yeah. Um, so, so let's talk about resolution. So, so when you talk about resolution, I mean, or when I, you know, say the word resolution, I'm always thinking of the resolution on my computer screen, mm -hmm. 1024 by 768, the, you know, the resolution of my, of the iPad, whatever. How does, how does that concept of resolution differ from the concept of resolution that astronomers talk about when they're doing their images? So with your computer screen, you can effectively say that the smallest possible thing that you can create is one pixel in size. And anything smaller than one pixel just can't exist. With our eye, with optics, with any sort of a system that's creating an image, what we talk about is the smallest possible uh, way of taking all of the wavelengths, all of the photons coming off of an object, and putting them together into a, a 
defined spot. So that sounds kind of weird, but the, the way to think of it is if you have a lens and you're focusing all the light from a point source, so it, the light beams are coming through and converging, what is the smallest possible dot you can make, the RE disk that you can make through that lens? And, I mean, I can think of some examples of times when the resolution really came into play. Um, do you remember there were some, some photos of Pluto that were released just a couple of years ago from the Hubble Space Telescope? And yeah. you could see these, um, you could see the, these, these dark and lighter s s sort of blotches on the surface of Pluto. And, but at the same time, it was clearly a very pixelated image that, right. that there just wasn't a lot of resolution there to be able to see anything in more detail. You weren't seeing craters and, and chasms and ice fields and, no. and cryovolcanism. -vol you were seeing that part's a little bit lighter and that part's a little bit darker. And as, the, as Pluto was rotating, those, you could see those lighter and darker parts moving around the the, the dwarf planet, but still, um, yeah. you know, you weren't seeing the resolution. So is that really, you know, that's where you really see it, right? Right. So, so what's happening here is as we try and look at Pluto with, in this case, the Hubble Space Telescope, you're focusing the light onto a detector and your ability to, to resolve an object is limited by two factors. One is the size of the telescope. And the, the size of Hubble limits you to being able to see about what's called 0 0.05 arc seconds. And, and this is an angular measurement. So if you've ever played with a protractor, you know it's, it's 180 degrees from left to right and there's 60 minutes in a degree, there's 60 seconds in a minute, and if you pull out a piece of hair, and I'm not going to do that, and you hold it out at arm's length, the width of that normal standard piece of hair held out at arm's length is one arc second across. In the human eye, its limiting resolution is about that one second, one arc second hair at arm's length. So with Hubble, we're able to see significantly smaller, that 0 0.05 arc seconds. But Pluto's kind of tiny, and, and so that 0 0.05 arc second resolution doesn't allow you to see a whole lot of detail. And this is, so I guess we can imagine that there was, say, a moon around Pluto, and it was smaller than that 0 0.05 arc seconds that, that Hubble can see. Hubble wouldn't be able to detect that moon. Well, it, it would be able to detect it because there's still light coming off. So, so this is one of those things in astronomy that can get confusing at times. You have a light source. It's radiating light. All of that light quite happily hits a pixel. And there's a difference between whether or not you detect it and whether or not you resolve it. So you're ah. able to detect that light, but you're not able to resolve it into, well, what does that look like? What's the shape of that? So we're able to detect things like stars. We can't resolve stars but we detect them all the time. And, and so this is the difference between pretty picture and blob of light, and mostly we just see blobs of light. Right, all of the, so even with the Hubble Space Telescope, if you're gonna view a, a distant star, you're just gonna get the light coming off of it, but you're not gonna yeah. be able to resolve a disk. But there, there are a few cases, right, where the, the resolution of the detector is, is good enough that you right. actually can resolve a disk, right? Hasn't, like, Betelgeuse been resolved? Betelgeuse has been resolved. We, we've resolved the stars in the Alpha Centauri system. And in all of these cases, it wasn't one single telescope doing the job. And, and this is where it gets tricky. The ability of a telescope to resolve an image it is based on two different factors. We're going to keep having things that are based on two different factors today. Um, one of those factors is what color of light are you using? If the color of light you're using has an extremely long wavelength, well, if your wavelength is longer than the object you're trying to look at, the, the wavelength isn't going to allow you to resolve the object. So you need to use shorter wavelengths of light to be able to resolve finer details. Now, at the same time, you have to be able to, um, well, you have to be able to take all of those wavelengths and combine them in a meaningful way. And the more wavelengths you can combine, the better you're going to do. And the more wavelengths you can combine depends on how big is your detector. Now, this starts to work in a kind of screwball way because it's not actually I have one, two, three, four, five stacked across and I'm collecting all five. It actually has to do with 
the separation between these two is, well, actually usually thousands of wavelengths, and I can cut a hole out of the center. Or I can actually cut a whole lot of holes out, and we call that the very large array in New Mexico. So the resolution that you get depends on how far apart are the two most extreme wavelengths that you detect in your baseline between the two telescopes. And, and so that baseline or the diameter of your single mirror, your single, single dish, that defines your resolution in combination with what wavelength you're looking at. And so then, I mean, I mean, you were talking about the, the very long baseline array. That's a good example, right, where astronomers are, are putting telescopes really far apart, in this case radio telescopes, to give a greater resolution. Yes. Is there a downside to that, though? Well, so with, with using lots and lots of telescopes, you're, you're not necessarily going to have the same light gathering power that you'd have. So, so you can actually take two one-meter mirrors spread them far ap apart and along one single axis get extremely high resolution, but you still only have two one-meter telescopes. So right. you can have extremely high resolution for observing fairly faint objects, or fairly bright objects, rather. And, and then there's that, it depends on the shape of your baseline. So you can imagine that you're cutting lines across an object. So if you're trying to look at a galaxy, and you only see along north, south, and east, west really high resolution, and in all the other directions, it's kind of crud because you don't have telescopes along those directions. It ends up leading to you can only get so much improvement. So we tend to use techniques like this for very specific questions where, for instance, we're trying to measure um, the diameter of an object, where we're trying to do spectroscopy. There, there's specific applications for interferometry. But if you're trying to build up an entire picture all at once, which radio telescopes don't do, which is why this is so optimal for radio telescopes, um, if you're trying to build up the entire picture all at once, like we do with standard optical telescopes, this starts to get difficult. You also run into problems where we don't usually do this with optical telescopes, because the ability to add the light together, well, that gets harder and harder as you deal with shorter wavelengths. You, you actually need to take the light coming off of each telescope and shift it so that the peaks in the light, the peaks in the phase of the wavelength, line up from each of the telescopes. And there's delays introduced by, well, the starlight hit this telescope first because that part of the planet's a little bit closer to the star. And the differences do matter when you're dealing with wavelengths of light. And this telescope is on a part of the planet that's a little further from the star, trying to add all of that light together. Well, in the radio, it's easy. We have really long wavelengths. We can record each telescope separately and add the light together after the fact. You can't do that in optical light. You have to physically use uh, change the separation between the telescopes using fiber optics and other techniques. And it's, it's, it's difficult and persnickety, and the timing has to be correct, and we don't generally do it. Right. So we always get this question, right? Like, why couldn't we just, couldn't amateurs provide thousands of small telescopes around the world, and together those telescopes would act like, like one big telescope, but yeah. unfortunately, they would still just only act like thousands of small telescopes. They wouldn't be able to combine their light together because right. you can't synchronize the the wavelength so that you're viewing at exactly the right moment with all those telescopes, or it would just be pro prohibitively hard. So, yeah. so then what are the factors that define resolution? You know, if you're trying to maximize your resolution, what would you try to do? So, so the, the realities are you, you want to get rid of the atmosphere. Can't always do that. Um, so I was recently asked, well, don't professionals have a way of getting rid of clouds when they're observing? No, no, we don't, but we do have space-based telescopes, and that's one way to get above the cloud, get away from the clouds, is you just go above them. So, so um, you've got this, I mean, you've got this atmospheric dis distortion, yeah. but, but is it, how is that ruining your resolution? So, here, you have the light is actually getting moved around as it passes through the atmosphere. So imagine you're looking at a galaxy, and the light from two close together stars ends up crossing back and forth across each other as the light passes through the atmosphere, and each set of ray of lights passes through slightly different pockets of, of cold and warm air. It, it blurs your image out. Uh, most of, 
uh, the places on the surface of the planet you go, you set up your telescope, you have typical conditions of about three arc seconds seeing. You go to the best places in the world and you can get a little bit better than one arc second. So you can see a little bit better with your telescope than you can with your eyeball. And that's depressing. Yeah. Now, we do have ways of compensating for this. The very best telescope for doing this right now, and this, will, this is always changing, is, is the very large telescope down in Chile. And it flexes its mirror to compensate for what the atmosphere does to the light that comes, comes through. And so they're able in real time to reverse engineer the paths of the light and basically fix the seeing. And, right. and they're capable of getting better resolutions in some cases than the Hubble Space Telescope. But that takes advanced technology. If you're right. just using an everyday telescope, aim for 0.8 arc seconds, best case. Right, and so in the perfect world, you would set up your telescope down in the, you know, the high plains of Antarctica where you're above, you know, any any atmosphere, cold, cold sky. You've got or Atacama is better. Atacama, Atacama is great. You've got a beautiful view of the sky and nice Chilean food nearby. Um, <laughs> Not so nearby. It's kind of isolated. But oh, you're, really? you only get a couple millimeters of rain a year. Yeah. yeah. And, and you get night every night, which helps. Yeah, so so that is uh, oh, oh right. Of course, you get you don't get any clouds at all. So right. So so step one to improve your resolution is have the best possible seeing conditions that you can. Ideally, just get into space. Right. So so beyond that, um, you want to maximize the diameter of your optical system. Uh, and and by this, I also mean radio, X-ray, whatever system, whatever light gathering technique you have. Get the greatest diameter possible. If you want to image an object beautifully, use a single mirror or stamp your way across it basically doing one pixel at a time as they do in a lot of radio. Um, and if you really want awesome resolution, you need to step out and use interferometry, which is where you're combining light from multiple sources that are separated. Because at a certain point, people are going to get angry at you if you try and make a telescope that big. And there's just not enough resources to support telescopes that have thousand kilometer diameters. Who would get angry? They, I think we would all cheer and applaud, you know, attempts to build telescopes a thousand kilometers across. <laughs> yeah, that but people have fantastic. to live somewhere and think of the miners yeah. that would be required. Think of the <laughs> yeah. ceramics facilities. Yeah. It, it just starts to become intractable. It makes the Earth look like the Death Star with, a, with <laughs> one whole portion of it is carved into a giant telescope. I love it. I think we should get right on that. But, but yeah, you know, that, that the point is that you can fake it. You can take... Yeah multiple radio dishes, set them a thousand kilometers apart, line up the frequencies or line up the um, the timing yeah. so that they are truly observing the same wavelength, the exact same wavelength or the time that the, the light was emitted from that, that object and they are essentially providing that resolution. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and we do this. There's international agreements that facilitate it. Now, how far down the, because I know that, as we've said, with things like the Very Large Array, you know, with some of these optical telescopes, you can only have them a few hundred meters apart and they start to get messed up. But in other cases, you can say um, with radio, they can be 1,000 kilometers apart and work just fine. So well, with radio, there, there's not really a limitation other than the ability to get your clocks in sync, which, which we're learning is more and more difficult than one would think as we're looking at the CERN results recently. Um, but, but that's where your limits start to come in, is, is how do you get the data back and how do you synchronize it? So right now with radio telescopes, we're literally limited strictly by the diameter of the planet Earth. And you record the data, you ship it to a single place. This was actually my high school job, was finding fringes on data. Um, it was one of the different things I did. And uh, yeah, as long as the timing is correct or mostly correct, I remember having difficulties with the Russian data because their clocks got off. You can sort it out. You can figure it out. But that's for radio. For optics, right now we're kind of limited to the size of a plateau in the, in the um, Chilean mountains. Right, right. And so you can imagine some future super clocks that would let people stretch those telescopes further apart, but but that hasn't, there's no plans in the works. Mostly well, people are going with bigger, 
you know, the overwhelmingly large telescope. They're looking for 10, 20, 30 meter telescopes, gigantic telescopes, right? And and you start to get into to limitations of just how do you get all that data back? I mean, one, one of the questions that, that we seem to get all the time is, well, when are we going to be able to, to, to resolve cities on other planets and things like that? And there you start looking at, well, if you try just waiting for the data to come back from opposite ends of the telescope starts to be a little crazy. <laughs> so so I actually worked the numbers out on this before we got started on the show. And if you take the planet Earth and you put the planet Earth uh, in the Alpha Centauri system and you just want to resolve the planet Earth, that starts to be something that's almost tractable. You can do that with a telescope that has a diameter of just over 2,000 kilometers. So that, that's not that bad in the grand scheme of things. 2,000? Um, no, no, that's a good thing. A yeah. 2,000 kilometer telescope is great. You want to resolve the size of the Earth at a distance of roughly um, 10 light years away. There you're starting to look at, you need something that's about 4,800 kilometers across. Still, still tractable as long as you're working in the radio. Now the Earth doesn't exactly give off radio light and that, that's um, frustrating. So I actually ran the calculations imagining we can do this with red light. And interferometry, we're able to do infrared right now. So red light isn't too big a stretch. So imagine a future where we're somehow able to get the red light synced up across these distances. So you have amazing fiber optic, detect fi fiber optic cables spanning the diameter of the Earth. Yep. They're roughly 5,000 kilometers. Now, we often talk about someone in Andromeda looking at the planet Earth would be able to just, um, if they had magical non-existent telescopes, they'd be able to make out the earliest men working on the, walking on the surface of the planet. Right, two and a half million years ago. So, so the reason I say make-believe won't happen is to be able to simply resolve the size of the planet, not the size of a human, the size of the planet. We need a telescope that is uh, about 100 times the size of the solar system, that, that's uh, 8,500 astronomical units apart. And that's where you start to worry about how do you get the data back in a sensible way. This, this is fractions of a light year, meaningful fractions of a light year, and that starts to get a whole lot more challenging. Right, right. So uh, anyway, but the point being, uh, big, bigger is better. Yeah. So now, and, and and whether and you shorter wavelengths is better. And and shorter wavelengths is better. Right, because the the shorter the wavelength, the smaller the thing you can see. We we get into this in, micro right, in microscopes right, right. much more. So it, if you're working with with a normal green light, that's the central light in visual with what you see in your eyes, with with a standard visual light centered on green microscope, the smallest thing you can possibly resolve is 250 nanometers across, and that's way bigger than most molecules. But and that's you why you push into electron... Right, or x-ray microscopes. Right. It's actually in x-ray that we get the highest resolution because the x-rays are actually smaller than, than the electrons. So, so with x-rays, here you start to be, with the best telescopes we have so far, able to resolve 15 nanometers when you're shining the x-rays through the source. This is still um, about five times bigger than the width of DNA. So we can't yet resolve the DNA helix cleanly. We know it's there. We've figured it out through other methods. But if you're using transmission microscopes, 15 nanometers is currently the limit, and x-rays destroy a lot of samples. So we've talked about we've talked about the scene conditions, and I'm just going to assume you know how well you've polished your mirror and how good yeah. the you know the internal optics are of your of your telescope. We yeah. talked about the size of it, and then and I guess the third one is just the wavelength. So you're not going to you know if all you have is a radio wave that has a has a wavelength of five meters, you're not going to be able to see something that is smaller than five meters, right? Because right. It's, just, it's it's just passing right by it. And, and this also starts to give you a hint of why radio telescopes are systematically so much bigger than optical telescopes. Mm -hmm. The wavelengths themselves can be thousands of times bigger. And, and so in order to get the exact same resolution between the two systems, you have to 
extraordinarily large telescopes. Right, right. And so then what are the sort of record holders? What are the, what are the telescopes? If you, if you needed resolution, if you were going to do a job that needed resolution, like I'm, I'm imagining, like say you want to pick out a, you know, a planet orbiting another star, optically you're going to want high resolution so that you can resolve the star. Yeah, we can't do that right now. No, I understand. I understand, <laughs> right? But the star... Well, no, but but, but, but if you were in infrared, let's go to infrared. Yeah, I mean, we can do it in infrared. Oh, well, so Spitzer on one hand is good, but but the very large telescope is is actually better if you know exactly when and where to look. Because here you can start to use, they, they have an amazing interferometry system where they can tie in their four many meter telescopes and they have a bunch of little one meter telescopes that they can move out along different baselines. And they're able to actually get down to about 0.05 arc seconds, no big deal, and smaller along individual specific wave, uh, individual specific baselines. Right. Okay, so, so if you wanted the highest possible resolution image that you could get in optical, what tool would you want to use? So if you just need along one baseline, very large telescope. It, the entire system, tie all the telescopes, move the little spuds out, and bring all the light together. Right. Um, Interferom them all it, together. It, exactly. It, yeah. If you want to take a pretty picture, where the whole picture has the the most amazing resolution you can get, then pick a very large telescope, use it with a laser guide star or an actual guide star, flex the tar out of the mirror to keep up with, with changes in the atmosphere, and that will get you as good as you can get. So you would, if were it up to you, you would pick the the very large telescope over the Hubble Space Telescope? It, it actually can get higher resolution because it's that much bigger of a mirror. Right. Now, for tried and true, Hubble consistently does amazing work. And the thing with Hubble that's different, and there's certain science where this really matters, is when you start flexing the mirror, you can't guarantee that the two photons that are now in focus both left the object at the same time. So you're introducing all sorts of weird issues that start to become an issue in certain types of science. With Hubble, you're getting all of the light that was emitted at the same time, hitting your mirror, getting focused together, and you're getting a tried and true, beautiful, well-resolved image from a 2.5 meter telescope. Hmm. And so then if you wanted to go into another wavelength, if you wanted to get like a really high resolution uh, infrared, what would you go? Infrared, uh, you can do all of infrared from Spitzer on orbit. You can do some of the infrared depending on what colors get through the atmosphere versus what colors you're interested in. Uh, you can do some of that from the Very Large Telescope. Um, again, interferometry is awesome. As you start to push into the radio, uh, submillimeter, submillimeter, wait for Atacama to get built. Uh, there's also a submillimeter array in Hawaii that does a, a very good job. Um, as you push into the radio, the best you can possibly do is get the whole planet engaged and start looking at things by, by getting the telescopes in Europe and America and everywhere else working together to do very long baseline interferometry. Is a lot of work done organizing all those at the same time, or is, does something really special have to happen to, to accumulate all those telescopes all at the it's, same time? It's, it's actually a proposal process where it's known this is going to happen. There are agreements that say we're going to pull all these telescopes together to do a certain amount of science every year. And there's some telescopes that are built specifically for this, the very large baseline array in the United States, for one. Um, and, and so there's dates that get announced, you're, said, you're told, okay, go propose, you propose, they say yes or no, they give you time on specific dates, they tell you which telescopes will or won't be engaged, and then you wait, and eventually you get your data. And if you wanted to go to the ultraviolet, there's pretty much just Hubble, right? Well, Swift. yeah. Um, Swift is still up there, um, and, and we're going to start to run out of ultraviolet abilities pretty soon, so... so yeah, that's one of the big downsides. Messiah. Yeah, is is the lack of ultraviolet astronomy. Yeah. So then, I guess X-ray. You've really just got Chandra. Well, it's Swift. I believe also has some X-ray detections on it. Right. And for gamma rays, you have Fermi, and you still have parts of Swift. Right. So there's still ways to see 
And then there's Chandra. Don't forget Chandra's doing a great job in the X-ray and refuses to die. Yeah it's, yeah, it's it's manufactured as well as the Mars rovers. It's just the <laughs> telescope that keeps on giving. Yeah, yeah, it's a great telescope. Great. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. That was awesome. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. Sounds good. Talk to you later, Fraser. And now you get to watch us save. And we'll open it up for questions as soon as we make sure our files are safe and sound and not going to disappear into oblivion. Okay, so I'm going to start looking through all of your questions. Let me move them over to a screen where you don't have to watch my head turned. Welcome, Dwight, to your very first Hangout. Um, so there's a question, what will be the increase in resolution of the James Webb Space Telescope compared to Spitzer and Hubble? Um, I need to look up the diameter of Spitzer and Hubble. It's, Hubble, it's a factor of a little more than three, somewhere between three and four. Um, what's, do you know the diameter of Spitzer, Fraser? Three meters? No, I don't, I don't know offhand. Okay, sorry. Oh, 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 oh sorry, the diameter of Spitzer? Yeah. Oh, no. Um, it's around the same as Hubble, isn't it? Hubble's, what, 1.6. Um, I was just posting the, I'm going to post the, the link to the Hangout as soon as my... So Spitzer goes. actually has a diameter of 0.85. There you go. So with a 0.85 diameter, you're looking at a factor of about 10 resolution in improvement. What, what, sorry, what was James Webb? James Webb, I believe, is an 8 meter. Wow. Let me double check that I'm not lying about that one. They, they've rescaled the, the telescope a few times. Um, oh, sorry, it's now 6.5. I lied. Um, so you're still looking at like a factor of 8-ish. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, so was resolution an issue when the Hubble Ultra Deep Field was taken? With the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, the, the primary concern was seeing how faint they could go. So, so there, yeah, sometimes things are simply blobs, but um, as they resolve deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, galaxies are luckily pretty big, even when you're looking back at the earliest moments in the universe. So even the most distant galaxies are several pixels across in Hubble, and they simply had to gather enough light to be able to, to see these immensely faint, immensely distant objects. Okay, so I'm posting the link to the Hangout itself. So as always, if you want to join us, we, we want to put preference on people who have questions to ask us. So if you want to just join us and then just hang, we prefer that you just watched and that will leave space for people who actually do have questions for yeah. us. Make sure you mute your microphone or you have some, some kind of head headphones on because what it turns into is just bad echo. So if you pop in and there's audio coming from your computer, it's going to echo back and just sounds terrible. So, so try to mute your microphone as quick as you can and try to get some, some headphones on if you can. Um, and everyone, if you could please, please, please plus one this, it allows us to know how many of you have been out there listening. There we go. And remember that this is live and public and will be recorded forever. So, uh, Don't you know, make us edit the audio. If you're a private person, no, no, but also if you're like a, you know, yeah. if you're worried about, about your privacy and stuff, this is public, so just, just be, be aware. Prepared. Yeah, be prepared. Cool. All right, so you got, you got those questions out the door. Let me see if there's any more here. Yeah, I think there's some on Twitter that I need to get to. Um, <laughs> I guess Someone's mocking your fuzz. Yeah. Someone wanted to know about the, uh, oh, somebody, someone asked about infrared and UV, which we went into. Um, the square kilometer array, we didn't talk about the square kilometer array. No, that, that's a new array being built either in Australia or South Africa. It's still being debated. And it's, it's working at longer wavelengths, and uh, it will improve uh, the combination of light gathering power and resolution over a lot of the systems that we have over a whole variety of baselines. So, so the I issue with using the whole planet as a baseline is you get high resolution along one kind of screwy axis. And with square kilometer, you get this amazing imaging power all the way around your image. Now, I know you're not a uh, biologist, but is there some sort of relation between the way insect eyes are segmented and, uh, and sort of high-resolution images that we're talking about? 
No, th this is one of those things I've heard several times. And with the segmented eyes, they're actually all pointed in slightly different directions. And the advantage of having all of these eyes pointed in slightly different directions is they're extremely sensitive to motion. But in order to combine all the light from the telescopes, you need all the mirrors pointed in the exact same direction. So very, very, very different. Got it. All right, so we've got some questions. And yes, uh, Detlef asked if, if Nicole Gugliucci, whose name I know I destroyed, um, is working on square kilometer. And yes, she is. And I'm going to encourage her to keep her uh, alliances with that when she gets here to work at SIUE with me and Fraser. Perfect. All right, so we've got a bunch of people here. So is anyone put your hand up if you have a question for us. There we go. All right. Go ahead, Bart. Hey, um, I was uh, wondering, why are you doing uh, those star parties on uh, Sunday evening? Because to me, that's like Monday morning really early. <laughs> and <laughs> if you do it on uh, Friday nights or Saturday nights, I can actually sleep in the next day. <laughs> well, so I would, I would like love, watch it live. I would love to do them uh, other times. I mean, it really just, I mean, this is why I made this plea in the episode itself to say if you're an astronomer and you got the ability to live stream, then please, please join yeah. us. So you know, we've got probably at this point, I think I've got 18, 17 astronomers in the list of people who can join. But when you set a time and date, then you're completely dependent on the seeing of each person and their personal schedules and whether they feel up to it and, and all that. And so so, for example, we had 17 people in the queue, and for various reasons, only two were able to show up. One was able to show up when we started, and one showed up, you know, a, a f half an hour after we, we began with some views of the moon and, and Mars. So, I can see that it's just a matter of scale. So, once I've got 30, 50, 100 astronomers who have the capability to do this kind of thing, then we'll start to get these numbers where we can have five people all at the same time. And then we can do things for sure, like like do some stuff in Europe. I mean, I have one person in Europe and I have one person in Turkey. And, and we've been talking with uh, the folks at the Virtual Astronomy Society about working with them. They're over in Great Britain. Um, and it's just a matter of trying to figure out how to translate their way of normally um, observing all together and talking on Facebook to observing all together and streaming the output. And we just haven't had a chance to test this out yet. but. Like Fraser was saying, we just need the observers in other parts of the world, and then we add dates and times. Yeah, and um, it would actually be my preference in many cases to do something which would be like evening European time, because yeah. then that's midday for, for North America. And so in many cases, you could be early afternoon, late afternoon, dinner time, and see, and see stuff that's streaming from really nice views of, of Europe when it's a lot darker for them. So that would be my preference. I would, you know, in my dream world, we would probably do this twice during the course of the week. One time with, with people streaming from, say, Asia Pacific and, and you know, the East and, and Africa, and then someone else, another group streaming from North and South America and maybe Europe as well. So, so that's kind of, that's my goal, but we're just not there yet. Yeah. Which, I mean, I'm patient. They keep, people keep popping out of the woodwork, and then I do tests with them, and we get to the point that it works out great, and they join the team, and, and we move on. Eventually, whatever, I just keep grinding away until we get it, so. Bart, you just need so to use a telescope. telescope. This is all you. It's all your fault. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, I don't, unfortunately. So, yeah. <laughs> I want to. I want to. But yeah. Until then, I'm stuck with YouTube videos. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get there. I mean, we've only or been maybe, doing this for two months. Or maybe now. some holiday where I can actually stay up uh, <laughs> and don't have to go to school the next day. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, yeah. It's it's on our list of things to try and figure out. Yeah. 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 Just okay. be patient. And I mean, we're 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 breaking new ground here, so it takes time. Okay. And I thought I saw uh, the star parties are still on Thursdays in the calendars. So maybe oh, we'll I need to switch the calendars. Thank you. I, I was on travel, and that tends to leave some things discombobulated. I will fix that right now. We have so much minutia that we have to deal with still. It's hilarious. Yeah, yeah and if it's the same time uh, on Sunday, for you, as it was on Thursdays, it's probably 2 a.m. GMT. It's an, hour, it's an hour later now. Yeah, yeah. so oh, it's... It's an hour it's later, so it's 3. Yeah. Okay. It, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to move to an hour later again 
probably yeah, I know. in another couple next of months. Week. Yeah. Next week. Yeah. Yeah. Next so as, week as we it's move going in... for us in Europe. Next oh week, right. Next week, yeah. This will go, and then two weeks later it'll go back. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah. And but this it... is the nice thing about the Google calendars is they do time zones for us because I would otherwise screw it up yeah. rather profoundly. But as we move into summer, right, the West Coast people aren't going to be able to show up until two in the morning for the East Coast people. So, so anyway, this is just welcome to living on a tilted mm. world. So, yeah. um, and, if so you, and if you want to uh, look it up easily, you can go to Wolfram Alpha. It's uh, you just begin sometimes and it shows up. So. Mm, cool. All right. So anyone else got a question for us? Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Hi. How, how are you doing, uh, Fraser? Good. And Pamela, how are you? I'm well. Okay, it's good to see you both. Um, you know, uh, before I, I ask my question, um, just you know, since we're talking about telescopes and stuff, um, I think one of my greatest thrills, one of the greatest thrills for me, would be to share a telescope with you somewhere, uh, a real hangout, uh, and just actually just be able to ask you questions and you can point out things. That would just be the biggest thrill in the world. So hopefully one day in my lifetime uh, that can happen. That would be so cool. Um, my question um, actually has to do with uh, global warming. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious about global warming, and I, you know, there's there's a lot of debate that goes on about it. Some believe that it is happening, some believe that it's not, some believe we're causing it, some believe there are other factors involved. Um, my question is, and 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 you know, I, I, I'm a bit cynical about everything, but um, I guess one of the things that comes to my mind is, you know, since there was an ice age, like Twenty some thousand years ago, eventually we had we experienced some sort of global warming that caused that to dissipate, and we emerged into what we are today. And my question is, if if there is global warming, wouldn't it uh, be a logical guess to suggest that maybe some factor that caused the ice age to warm up could possibly be causing global warming that that we hear about today? So. All the data, and, and the, when you talk to people who are debating if global warming is real or not, the ones who are saying it's not real are the ones who aren't actually following the data and have economic concerns. One, one of the problems that's factoring into the debate is um, what's necessary to, to actually change our behaviors to, to stop the, the progress of global warming will have economically devastating effects. Um, so global warming, all the scientific data says there is global warming, that um, it is most likely human caused due to the increase in a variety of chemicals in the atmosphere. And, and there, there's simply no getting around that. It's not the sun, it's not anything else. The, the things that contributed to ice ages in our past, however, would be even more devastating to humanity than the, the current short-term global warming effects. So you're looking at needing to have uh, massive volcano eruptions that completely choke the atmosphere with uh, ash. You're, you're looking at needing to have the sun undergo some sort of a radical change in its behavior that causes is less flux on the planet Earth. Uh, you're looking at needing to have the mid-ocean conveyor belt shut down, which causes uh, the, especially Europe, to go into massive glaciation while you have extreme heat building up in the tropical areas. All of these things are bad. The, the best thing that we can do is, is, as a planet, suck it up and, and suffer the economic doom I, and there's no friendly way to put it. A, a global warming, when you look at what's actually required to combat it, is terrifying. Um, you, you have to suck it up and say no more overnight delivery. Buy everything from within 100 kilometers, one car per household. There's, there's so many things that, as an entire planet, we'd have to embrace. I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't see a good solution. And I actually have a lot of friends that decide not to have kids because global warming just scares, scares the shit out of them. It's, it's not a good forecast. Well, it, 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 it's primarily CO2 emissions is what scientists say are causing it. Is that, is that correct? It's CO2, and there's also effects from other gases as well. Okay, because CO2 is what we exhale, right? And isn't, isn't a lot of the atmosphere itself made up of CO2? Atmosphere is primarily nitrogen, um, and this is very complicated. You, you can't 
just say we exhale CO2. It, it's a matter of what altitude do things happen, what a atmosphere, what altitude do various aerosols end up at, and it, it's an extremely complicated process. Um, the dominant factor is CO2 emissions, and this is where everyone talks about carbon footprints. I actually think, um, since this is an astronomy podcast, we should move on. But yeah. we're going to, I know we're going to be interviewing one of the cl a climate researcher um, blogger. Was it Michael Mann? Um, we're going to be doing that through Universe Today probably within the next couple of weeks couple of weeks, I think. Anyway, we'll, we'll keep people posted when we have more information on that. So we're going to be doing, we do interviews on Friday with people, and I think we're going to be hopefully talking to some climate researchers at some point. So, so we'll be incorporating that as well. So um, does anyone, and I think we, you know, I, I know we've been planning at some point to do a show on, on global warming, although I, I much prefer to talk about it from a sort of universe astronomy perspective and look at Venus and, and things like yeah. that, and places like Mars where we don't have enough global warming, right? Right. So yeah, go ahead, Graham. Uh, can you hear me okay now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, going back to um, interferometry, etc. One idea I had is if you could get all the, tele the, te well, the telescopes to take images, then six months later, then use them again, you'd have a telescope the sort of the diameter of the Earth's orbit. Uh, so, so the problem is you need to have all of the wavelengths of light that were emitted at the same time to get this to work. And, and so if, if you could put a twin to the planet Earth on the other side of the orbit, gather all of the light, and co-add it so that you have collimated light, light that has all of the phases in sync, then you could do it. The, the problem is you need to have the light collimated for interferometry to work. Okay. The other, the other right. way to do it... I'm sorry. Nope. The other... Oh, go ahead. Okay. The other possibility I just wondered is uh, if you could have telescopes at the two Lagrange points, uh, one behind and one forward of the Earth. That, that you can do. The, the only issue, again, is, is getting the light in phase. So there, that's easy to do with radio. We can do that with radio. It's, it's when you get into the shorter wavelengths, infrared, millimeter, opticals beyond us right now. The, the wavelengths are so short, and trying to line up the phases is just not something that's tractable with current electronics. But space is a place where you could theoretically line up telescopes in, in closer wavelengths with a little more accuracy than maybe you could on, on Earth because you're not going to deal with earthquakes and, and trucks driving by <laughs> and things like that, right? You're going to get, the, you're going to be able to park these telescopes in perfect position beside each other and, and, get, a, and get a really nice view. So I, I'm, I'm sure there are, there are interferometry missions in the sort of, on the planning stages, right? In the planning stages, there's just not any that are really funded. I mean, in fact, our our classic favorite, the Terrestrial Planet Finder, was yeah. at one point designed as an interferometry mission. So they would be this would be a series of telescopes all flying in formation. To yeah, using lasers to keep them in sync. To keep them in sync, yeah, and then you know push down the. You have to strike that right balance, right? What is the the nicest? Oh, you got a really bad. Feedback. I muted oh, him. There we go. Okay, Sorry, Grant. Um. Uh, yeah, so like what you know, you want to find that happy balance between the wavelength that's going to let you synchronize these telescopes up with the size that you're going to want to do. And so, as you move to shorter and shorter wavelengths, these you're going to have to keep them the telescopes tighter, and the timings going to become more important. So there's going to be some magic happy place. So how about our little New Zealander? That's it's. But but your name's not Kate. I've forgotten your actual name. All I know is no. you sent me the awesome picture that's sitting on my desk. So, what's your name? Callum. Callum. Sorry, Callum. It is Callum. I remembered. Yeah. Let me handle the names, Pamela. Go ahead. What's your question? Um, couldn't couldn't an explanation for the fact that the light you put is big gravitational waves? You, you know, it, that, that would, if it was only one experiment, that could work. So you, you can imagine that a gravitational wave came along with just the right path and caused the two places to be closer together than we thought. And, and gravitational waves actually have that funky effect. As they propagate through space, they contract and expand space. Now, 
the reality is we think they figured out what's wrong. We think that they figured out that one of the connections just wasn't tight enough and the gap created by not having the connection tight enough in the equipment created a bad timing error. So we think they figured it out. But he's, he's right, though. He's, he's, he's on a perfectly he, valid direction. That's a, that's a perfectly valid hypothesis, which is that you could end up with a gravitational wave, a very powerful gravitational wave moving through, squishing the Earth in between the two observers and making it seem like the, the neutrinos were traveling faster than the speed of light. So but probabilistically, if you repeated the experiment, the result would go away. So this is where we have to repeat experiments. But you, yeah. that's an awesome idea. It's an awesome Congrats idea. You would need to just detonate a black hole <laughs> just a couple of... Uh, form, not detonate. Oh, form, form yeah. a so black you hole. You need to detonate a star, turn it into a black hole a few astronomical units away from the Earth to get, a, you know, to get that kind of a gravitational wave. But that's, that's that would be cool. awesome. Yeah, it would be awesome. Um, except for the, um, everyone dying part. There could it be chance that they detected um, uh, that um, um, could it be chance that another gravitational wave happened to um, come by the, the, the next time they did the experiment? The probability of that happening is so small that that, that probably wouldn't happen. It, it's like saying that every time um, let me try and think of something that's as crazy. It's like saying that every time there is a earthquake in Christchurch, which is luckily not very often, but too often at the same time, imagine if every time that happened there was also a solar flare. Well, that is way, way more likely to happen, and that doesn't happen. So when you start talking about extremely rare things, they very, very rarely line up at the same time. But you should, you should submit it as your thesis for your doctoral program, and uh, you could possibly get that, uh, get that through. You might be able to get your, uh, your doctorate in And you need to keep asking these questions because yeah, you're asking an awesome, awesome question. questions. That's, a, that's, a <laughs> that's really good. Um, uh, so Thomas, Bart, did you have a question for or us? Or Thomas. Uh, do, do you mean me? Yes. In, yes. In Sweden. Yes. I have a question about the LRO, and uh -huh. uh, and and uh, I was thinking about that. I uh, read about it um, that you couldn't resolve the small rocks with the camera, uh, with the half a meter pixel resolution, but you can detect the rough ground with the mini RF. Is that due to the wavelength that the radar is working with, or is it, it something other? It, it's a combination of how the two of them work. So, so the reason with the narrow angle camera, which is their highest resolution camera, that we're not able to resolve anything smaller than about half a meter is because of the size of the mirror and the distance that LRO is away from the surface. But when they start using the other detectors to figure out what is the surface roughness, the way they're actually doing this is reflecting light off the surface and seeing how well it reflects back. And if you look at a perfect mirror, you see a perfect image come back. If you look at a really rusty, nasty mirror, when the light comes back, not all of it comes back. When you have an extremely, it's not really a mirror, it's just a piece of frosted glass, then you get much less light coming back. So by looking at how much of the light gets reflected back and how well it gets reflected back, we're able to make estimates of the roughness of the surface. And that's what they're really doing, is looking at the roughness of the surface. OK, so this, it's not an issue about resolution, then. It's an no. uh, issue about uh, detection. Exactly. So it, it's, yeah. it's, it's literally asking, is it smooth, or is it gravel, or is it boulders? Yeah. Thank you. Um, just got a couple of questions on the, uh, on the Google Plus stream here. Um, somebody wanted to know, could you use neutrino detectors as telescopes? No. No. We, we, it, no. It, the detectors, it, it, neutrinos are a bear to detect. You, you have to basically take a giant container, fill it with cleaning solution, and hope that maybe there will be one interaction and, and you can't focus that because right. what you're looking for is the neutrino to interact with something and the light from that interaction shoots off in random directions. Right. So you can't tell where the neutrino came from. Right. And, and a, a neutrino will gladly push through, a, what, a light year of lead? So um, to, try and, to try and focus them is, is brutal. Yeah. Um, uh, another question. Oh, someone wanted to know how they can see the star parties. So 
Um, the best way to do it, the guaranteed way to do it, is if you subscribe to uh, YouTube.com. If you go to YouTube.com slash user slash universe today, um, then, and then you can subscribe by email to get an update every time I post a new video to Universe Today. Then you'll get every Star Party get an email that I've posted it. So you go to Universe Today, you can subscribe to my feed by email, and then you'll always get um, a notification. The other way to do it is we'll post notifications on Twitter, we'll post notifications here on Google+, Plus, and we also post them onto CosmoQuest. So, and as over time, we're trying to find, think of other ways that we can get the word out because yeah. this is always the problem is we do these things, ran, you know, now we're doing them a bit on schedule, but we do kind of do them randomly sometimes. I will, yeah. I will always reserve the right to, if I have a good telescope view, I'll just drop it at the, drop everything and, and go live. So, um, but then I'll try and post the video afterwards. Um, Good. Other okay. questions? That's all the questions that I saw there. Okay, we have a hand up. We have two hands up, so. Uh, okay. Who goes first? <laughs> let's go, go, go ahead, with Bart. Callum. He had his head up. Oh, okay. Okay. oh, now we're getting each other's way out. Okay, let's go with Bart first because he started talking, and then we'll go back to you, Callum. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, those uh, back to those neutrinos, it was fiber optics that was off, right? Uh, that's what they, well, it was a connector of some sort. I think it was a fiber optic connector, but I don't want to lie to you and say for certain that's what it was. Okay, because they think it was a connector things into are a very GPS. hard to line up because it's only the yeah. core of this fiber optics cable which is getting used, and the rest is basically there for the strength of the cable. So well, it's, it's actually really small parts to prevent it, uh, the light from bouncing too much and getting delayed. So what's, what's really amazing is with these detectors, yeah. how much work goes into lining them up. My, my job uh, the, the summer after I graduated college was actually building fiber optic uh, units for Atlas on, uh, at the Large Hadron Collider. And, and what I was essentially doing was putting connectors in one side, putting fiber in one connector, weaving it down to another connector, making sure all the tension was perfect, and then handing it off to a, a postdoctoral fellow who would then shine standard lights through, make sure that the light in matched the light out, make sure everything lined up perfectly. There are so many checks and balances in the system. So alignment is less of a concern than, from what I understand, this was a matter of the connection within one of the computer units versus within the detector, yeah. uh, simply wasn't in all the way and introduced a GPS problem. So yeah. it... Well, well, I see similar things in the server room at school, so... Uh, yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not there all the time, but <laughs> I've been there <laughs> once <laughs> now. It's a really big space. And um, there's a, another question. Uh, why must the lights uh, originate from the same moment in time uh, I with these think telescopes? That's a good one. It's, it's the, the quantum mechanical properties at a certain level. Um, in order to get interference where the, the waves add up together, the waves have to be lined up perfectly. So if you've ever seen sea waves come in, um, if you have two holes in a seawall, you'll end up when the waves come through with really high places and really low places where the waves constructively add together or destructively interfere with each other you have to have the same properties with light where you need all of the phases of light to constructively interfere with one another to effectively add them together. A bit like sound waves where you have some yeah. places where it's really loud and some places where you don't hear a thing at all. A bit like that? Exactly. And okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a physics that's exactly experiment we've done at school. Uh, actually, that was a, a physics teacher who you uh, quoted, or at least you posted a... Uh, link to one of his articles. I think it was on Eros. That's awesome. So Very cool. <laughs> 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 so, okay, okay Colin, do you no. solve your question? I um, mute myself. Could you have this guy called Brian Cox on one of these Hangouts? Uh, if Brian Cox is willing to sign up for uh, Google+, Plus, you've, you've met him before, haven't you, Pamela? No, I, I, no? He's, he's one of the, the ones I haven't met. You're not talking about the player from the Miami Dolphins, are you? Not that Brian. No, no, no. We're no. talking about the British astronomer Brian. I'm just Cox. kidding. I'm, yeah. I don't like it. Yeah, he's. Um, yeah, no. I mean, I'm sure. I mean, Phil knows him. So if he wanted to get on Google Plus, same with Neil deGrasse Tyson. I mean, we definitely run in the same circles with Neil deGrasse Tyson. I think, as as yeah. I always say, I just think they're too afraid to handle the awesomeness here <laughs> on Google Plus. 
so you know they can't handle the questions like uh, like Pamela can. So I really think that's the problem. That's why it's happening. Yeah. Getting needed to grasp the Tyson would be wonderful. I would be willing to pay for just sitting in the same ha hangout as the grass or Alexander <laughs> Filipenko or, or something like that. It would Alex, be so uh, Alex is crazy. We can get Alex. That's already been done. Yeah, oh, I so we had Alex. A yeah, yeah, we had Alex a few weeks ago in in our Wednesday night science hour, which may be obnoxiously late for Sweden because we're doing that one at um, 7 p.m. Eastern, which oh. it makes it great for the folks in Australia. So we're trying to vary having shows like our Thursday morning hangouts that are optimal for Europe, and our Wednesday night uh, science hour, which is optimal for Australia. The planet just needs to stop rotating. Well, we do the um, our we've been interviewing people on Friday mornings, and uh, so we've we've had a chance to interview uh, Mike Brown, the Pluto killer, right, discoverer of Eris. We've had a chance to interview Alan Stern. We did that in the Weekly Space Hangout. We've had a chance to interview uh, Scott um, Maxwell, the the um, the Mars rover Mars driver. Mars rover driver. Yeah. Um, and uh, who do we interview? Oh, one of the people from the the Kepler team, uh, Garen. That was just. Uh, but Darren, that's just on, on last Friday. So again, if you miss them live, um, you can see them on our various feeds in YouTube and such. So. Okay. And as well. So yeah, Brian Cox, Neil deGrasse Tyson, if they were willing to show their heads on here on Google Plus, we would be all over it. Um, as well, something. Maybe. Go ahead. Maybe you can ask uh, André Kuipers if uh, he comes back from the ISS. You can ask him how, uh, how Kuiper is pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> it's nearly his last name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we're kind of getting near, near the hour. You had one last question, Ryan, before we get uh, to Yeah, I just had a quick question uh, for Pam. Um, you, you're, uh, you got my attention before when you started talking about lenses, I, I think some time, uh, a couple hangouts ago or so, and you said that uh, ultraviolet light could not pass through glass. And I, I thought that was fascinating. And the first thing that struck my mind, and I, I didn't think to ask the question at the time, is does that mean that all sunglasses are, are UV protected? Since they're... No, because they're most glass. sunglasses aren't made out of glass. Oh, so okay. if you have sunglasses made out of actual glass, uh -huh. they're all UV. But most uh, sunglasses are actually made out of some sort of a polycarbonate. And, or an acrylic or something like that. And these new, much lighter weight uh, uh, lens materials actually transmit, transmit UV quite happily. Okay. So that's where you need overcoatings that block UV. And that's okay. why you need to have a, a mirror-based telescope to be able to, to do UV. You can't use yeah. a, a lens-based telescope to do ultraviolet astronomy. It has to be a Newtonian right, with a mirror. So. Awesome question. That's really cool, actually. I never thought about that. Cool. Okay, well, I think we'll wrap this up at this point. So thanks to everybody who joined us. Thanks to everyone who's watching and didn't join us. And uh, we will see all of you. What's, so what's next? I guess that's your uh, Wednesday night, your Wednesday afternoon science hour. So our, our next, yeah, so our next event is going to be the Wednesday night science hour. This is an event that is at 6 o'clock central. Uh, which is an absolutely useless time for me to state, but that's the one that came up on my on my clock. Um, if if you go to cosmoquest.org slash blog, everything is listed there. Uh, cosmoquest.org slash blog slash calendar will get you all of our events for all time, or at least as far as we've scheduled them. And and I'd encourage all of you to go log in and keep up to date with everything we're doing. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks again, Pamela, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Bye.